Today on No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. The whole scope of this is the wonderful message of salvation that has come. The Gentiles are being, are being given this wonderful blessing. And God is not done. And Paul says, listen, I am an example of the remnant. Because, because I was super zealous for God. And in my zeal for the Lord, I persecuted the church. I didn't understand how these knuckleheads, these uncircumcised guys, how they could get away with all this stuff. And until I discovered personally that it was the grace of God at work. It was giving people what they don't deserve. And all of a sudden, I find myself saying, amen and amen. Because God has given me what I don't deserve. You're innocent blood. He showed his love Taking the cross for us No greater love Than innocent blood Welcome to No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. The Jewish nation of Israel are God's chosen people. He chose to use them to birth the Messiah and gave him as a savior of the world. As we read scripture, it's so important we understand how God has and is working with Israel because they play a major role in biblical prophecy. Israel is a distinct people group God has chosen to work with and the church is a distinct people group God has chosen to work through. Both are important and both are distinct in scripture. As we pick up our study today in Romans 11, Paul reflects on the relationship between Israel and the rest of the world and God's plan of salvation. We learn how God is not done working with Israel nor has he rejected them. However, salvation has been given to both the Jew and the Gentile. Let's dive into our study we've titled, Some Believe. And now, here's Pastor Jeff. Wasn't that pessimistic, only some believe? Nope. It's an accurate reflection of what goes on in the pages of scripture from Genesis to the book of Revelation. An accurate reflection. Even though there is a lot of religious activity, even though there's a lot of religious uh, excitement that was happening in Jerusalem at the start of the Passion Week, even though in 2019 that we get all kinds of things that are going on, we got Easter egg hunts at churches to draw people out next week for Easter and all of that great stuff and bounce houses and barbecues. And let, let me tell you, all that stuff is cool and fun and awesome and exciting and praise God. But all the religious activity in the world does not change a right relationship with Jesus. It is all about a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And the right relationship comes with the Lord through a right understanding of who we are as people. That we are a sinful people. We are, we are sinful in all of our ways. Right to the very core in understanding what Christ came to do is super important. And so some believe and the struggle that was going on with Israel here, uh, the, the problem as Paul was addressing them, nine, chapters 9, 10, 11, is nothing more than the simple fact of unbelief. Unbelief, 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 unbelief. That was the deal. Man, last week, by way of application, God gave us some super powerful, like brought it right here, right to this room, some amazing application for us at the very close of the message. God took a powerful message out of Romans 10 and he turned it around and he made some specific application to us as a fellowship. If this is your church and you didn't, uh, you didn't attend last week and you haven't seen last week's message, I'm encouraging you, get online and see that message because it's for us. God is doing something here for us. Yes, uh, you know, by way of in the, in, in the fellowship, he's working. Yes, he's working around the globe and around our city and our state and all that stuff. Yes, but he, he brought something to us very specific for us. And I love that about the Lord because God can take things and he can, he can, just, he, he can just bring that application right home to us. While we learn what, what Israel was struggling with, with that aspect of unbelief, God narrowed it down to, hey man, here's how unbelief is showing up in this fellowship or in our hearts and that was a challenging part. So the struggle. Take a look at uh, Romans 10, final verse. Verse number 21. All through chapter 10, or the last portion of chapter 10, we got a, uh, you know, a number of places where he quotes Isaiah. He gets down to the last verse. He says, but to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and a contrary people. And so that's that's how Paul was wrapping up chapter 10, and now he moves and he spills here in to chapter 11. We know in the original text there's not these chapter breaks and verses and all that stuff, so the writing continues on. 
following all day long. I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. He says immediately, he says, I say then, has God cast away his people? And he puts a question mark right there. Paul is saying, has God cast away the nation of Israel? Has God cast them away? He answers it. He says, certainly not, exclamation. And he says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleased with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. That, that God in his supernatural awesomeness as he is, he is working things out. And God has not forsaken the Israel, the Israel, <laughs> the nation of Israel. He hasn't forsaken them. But why does this matter to us? Well, it matters to us in a couple reasons, okay? Uh, number one, that we would understand the faithfulness of God, that God keeps his word, and, and that God's ways are above our ways even, and pastor finding out. Yeah, all that stuff is true. But, 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 but perhaps this morning as we start our study, maybe I would give you a caution point here today. Because, because understanding the pitfalls of how we take the scripture, read the scripture, apply the scripture, what the scripture teaches... All of this stuff has meaning in the hope that we carry through life. If I was to say here, and I would prepare you all the days of my ministry, folks, get ready for the tribulation period. You're going through the tribulation. You're going to be in it. You're going to experience the, you know, God's wrath and all that stuff. Now, how excited would you be? Oh, oh boy, the tribulation period is coming. Yeah, and I'm going to be stuck in the middle of it. And I noticed there's a little shh in different spots of the room. So this is a good topic we're on, perhaps. Listen, what you do with Israel matters how you interpret the New Testament. What you do with Israel matters in terms of how you look at the book of Revelation. All of this stuff is super, 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 super important. So I want to give you a point of caution right here for what Paul is teaching. Because again, whatever you do with Israel, if you miss what he's opening up chapter 11 with about God not forsaking his promise to the nation Israel that there is a remnant and those, those remnant are the elect and then we have the, you know, the big picture of the nation of Israel. If you don't understand how those come together and exactly what he's writing through this particular chapter, you're gonna get lost in understanding portions of the New Testament and it's gonna jack up your reading. And so I wanna give this to you. The first example is this, is that there are people believe, there are some people that believe that the church has replaced Israel. And I want to give you the evidence that is behind that. Right here in the very beginning, Romans 11 and 1 and 2, Paul is telling us the straight up point, plain fact is that God has not forsaken Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. But when we view scripture that way, and when I read that into scripture, it creates a distortion. Again, the prophetic picture changes and it misplaces all the events in the New Testament. Here's another example that I wrote down as we go down through this. In, in, in the book of Revelation, in fact, let's, let's just turn there for a second, very last book of your Bible, and I'm hoping, um, I, I am going to fly through this stuff, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, your brain is at least catching some of it as we move through this. Uh, in the book of Revelation, in uh, chapter 1, verse number 3, we have the apostle John as he writes down the message that he's getting. And in verse number three, it says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it for the time is near. I'm not going to break that down. We've already studied that. But, but understanding nothing more than this is that when we understand the book of Revelation, that, that we can capture it and go, oh, man, this is a blessing. God has, has put a blessing in here for the person that reads single and for those, plural, that hear the prophecy of this book. And, and, and what is God sharing out of this particular book? Well, in chapter 1, verse 19, flip the page in your Bible uh, to go to verse 19. Well, maybe, you're, maybe your Bible has it on the same page. Mine's on the next page. Uh, the command that the, the Apostle John has given in verse number 19 is from Jesus. He says, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. What's the point? Nothing more than this. Is, is that the outline to the book of Revelation is very simple. It's given right here in this, this verse. What does he deal with? The stuff that you have seen, that John had seen, the past. 
okay? He's writing out also the, the stuff that is, okay? The present and the things that will take place. It is the future. And so that is the outline to the book of Revelation. And, and when, we, when we view the scriptures in this capacity and we keep Israel in its right spot and the church in its right spot, we can understand the, the prophetic timeline and, and we can wrap our minds around the book of Revelation and we don't get all of these different pieces and parts uh, tangled up in the scriptures. I don't go to a place where I don't understand, so it's like, well, I don't understand what he's saying, so I gotta spiritualize this. You know, I've gotta move to a place of allegorizing this, otherwise it just doesn't fit my theology. Listen, we wanna take a little interpretation of the scripture, and in that little interp interpretation of the scripture, what Paul is bringing to us in Romans 9, 10, and 11 is that he is specifically addressing God's faithfulness, God's sovereignty, God's justice, all of that stuff as is laid over the top of Israel's unbelief. And in spite of national Israel's unbelief, God's faithfulness to continue to work with them as a nation is still in place. It hasn't changed. And so when we, when we read through the book of Revelation or we study the book of Revelation, we can come to this place of going, I know with certainty that the first three chapters of the book of Revelation that God is speaking to the church. I'm not confused on this. I know that as I go into chapters four and five, that okay, now God is showing the picture of the church in heaven now after the rapture. And then as, as Revelation continues on in chapter six all the way through chapter 18, I know that I can understand this because God is giving to us life on earth after the church has been removed from the earth. He's showing me these things. And here's the culminating point that I want you to wrap your mind around. If you've gotten none of that stuff, here's the point that I want you to wrap your mind around. Is in the finality of the book of Revelation, chapter 19 through 22, he gives the final events. The final events are laid out in scripture for us. Well, what are those? Well, he deals with the great tribulation, which is the, 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 the second three and a half year period or the final three and a half year period of world history. He deals with the second coming of Christ. Well, what is that? Well, as we've studied, or when we studied the book of Revelation, we learned that the second coming of Christ is Christ's physical return to the earth. At the time of the rapture, what did Jesus do? He met the church in the air, okay? He called the church up to him. But at the second coming, it's him touching down on earth, right? The Mount of Olives. So his physical return to the earth. All of this is shown. These final events are laid out there in the final chapters of the book of Revelation, we see the millennial kingdom. What is that? That's a fancy term. It, listen, it is literally the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. On earth, right here. You know, justice and things are gonna be restored and, and Christ, we're gonna be ruling and reigning with Christ. That is right here on earth, the millennial kingdom. We're gonna see the great white throne judgment. You know, uh, what, what, what is that? And when does it take place? It's at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ that there is that great white throne judgment. Those that have not accepted or embraced Christ will, be, will stand before the Lord and they will receive, their, their lives will be graded on what they've done with Christ and, and be judged for all the sin that has happened. And then a new heaven and a new earth happens. Now, that sounds very systematic, and it is, okay? I didn't make that stuff up. I'm just kind of regurgitating it, if you will. Is that being the flow and the teaching of Scripture? But in that flow and teaching of Scripture, when we get the church in Israel confused and we mix all of that stuff up and we say, well, the, the church has replaced Old Testament Israel and now all these promises go here, then all of that easy, systematic understanding the scriptures, uh, understanding the prophecy, all of that stuff goes out the window because I start, I start having to guess, I start having to spiritualize and allegorize and move all of these things in there and there no longer is a place of certainty. Now, my hope and my prayer is, is not that that rubs you wrong, but that that gives you a right understanding and an, and an anchor to go, man, if God wrote it, he's put it there for a particular reason. And if God has put it there for a particular reason, he wants me to understand it. In understanding the scriptures, what happens? It brings great hope and certainty to my heart. When Jesus came into Jerusalem there at the beginning of the Passion Week, his ministry was at the conclusion and at the completion of that time, even though he had spoke, even though he had given all the testimony of the healings, you know, the, 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 uh, the blind receive sight, the dead are raised to life again, you know, the lame, you know, their, their, their limbs are healed. People that are held in um, captivity are released, slaves to sin. They're released, all of this stuff. Even though Jesus walked and talked and he was among his very creation, people did not believe. 
there was only a remnant that was saved. Amazing. Now, all of these particular distinctions are there, and we get to point number one of the study. Point number one is this, remnant. We read the first six verses here in um, Romans 11 and 1. And, and, and if we were to take these first six verses and just kind of put a stamp over the top of it, here's the stamp, remnant. That's it. Okay, verse number one, what is this all about? There's a remnant of Israel that has responded to what Jesus has done, that has responded to the Messiah, that has responded to the Savior, that has responded to Jesus Christ. There is a remnant. And Paul, what he does is he lays out and he says, look, right there, uh, verse one and B. He says, I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. He's saying, listen, man, I'm an example. Only a remnant is, is, is being saved. Sure, okay, great, that's awesome. And God has saved me. God's not done working. He's not casting aside the nation of Israel, he still has a plan. They play a very you know, big picture here in that, you know, the, the prophetic plan of the book of Revelation for sure, right? You'll remember with me that there'll be 144,000 witnesses that God uses. These are of the Jews. He is not done with the nation Israel. But I will tell you this, that just because God has not cast aside the nation of Israel. He is not, um, uh, in the sense of done away with them. They're, they're no more, nothing else is gonna happen. Not that. He has, he has set them aside. He's pushed the pause button on what he's doing with them. He's, he's gone out. The message has gone out to the Gentiles. And I'm hoping that most of you, maybe you're all Gentiles. I'm a Gentile. But if you're of Jew, Jewish descent, praise the Lord. Maybe you're part of the remnant. I don't know. All I know is this, is that God is is working in this time because the Jews, because national Israel has rejected him and the message has gone out to the Gentiles. Paul was a minister to the Gentiles. We're studying the book of Romans, which was written you know, to those that were up in Rome. And while there's a certain section here that he's addressing uh, the Jews with, the whole scope of this is the wonderful message of salvation that has come. The Gentiles are being, are being given this wonderful blessing and God is not done. And Paul says, listen, I am an example of the remnant because, because I was super zealous for God. And in my zeal for the Lord, I persecuted the church. I didn't understand how these knuckleheads, these uncircumcised guys, how they could get away with all this stuff and, until I discovered personally that it was the grace of God at work. It was giving people what they don't deserve. And all of a sudden, I find myself saying amen and amen because God has given me what I don't deserve. In verses two through four, he goes on, and, and what does he do at this stage? Well, at this stage, because he's still talking about the remnant in verses one through six, in verses two to four, he goes and he gives the story regarding Elijah out of First Kings. Um, I don't know if we have time, but maybe I should just fly over there for a second. Uh, First Kings chapter 19, a couple high points on that chapter. You don't have to turn there. I can just read it to you. But in First Kings 19, verses number 10, we find Elijah saying, and he's just, he's, you know, at this point, he's, he's a depressed prophet, if you will. He had a great victory over Baal, but now, oh my goodness, Jezebel's going to get him, and Ahab, and he's all depressed, and there he is in a, in a cave, and in, at the end of verse number 10, he says, I alone am left. He's crying out to God, I alone am left. Lord, take my life. I'm done. I'm ready. You know, so you, you don't think that uh, uh, pastors go through rough times? Well, here's an example. This dude is straight done. He's ready to jump off the bridge. God, take my life. This is terrible. It's, it's not good. He gets down to verse number 14. He says again, oh, Lord, they've killed all your prophets. And, and he says within that verse, he says, I alone am left. And then we have the wonderful, wonderful response from God in verse number 18, where God gives him clarity on this. And the Lord says, listen, man, I love you, boy. Thank you so much for what you've done. Thank you for sharing your heart with me. I'm not gonna kill you, okay? So just settle down, relax a little. You're not the only one that's out there. And I don't know how often you felt like you're the only one that's going through the struggles, but I tell you, more times than I care to admit that I feel like I'm the only guy going through the struggles. I feel like I'm the only, Lord, doesn't anybody care? <laughs> why don't people come to church? You know, why don't they do all this stuff? Why, why, why? Lord, only me, and you know, I, I can get into that thing. And God sets them straight. He says, listen, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. God's saying, I got it under control. There is a remnant 
that I have preserved and reserved and is set here for me. So again, verses one through six, back in Romans 11, he's dealing with nothing more than the remnant. And as he goes down, he also says that at the very moment, and in fact, this would apply to us in this very second, you know, I, I could tell you that right now in this very second, there are those people from the nation of Israel of Jewish descent that are Messianic Jews, that they have believed in Jesus, right down. So, so the remnant exists not only here in the Old Testament, not only right here in Paul's time, but also in, in the days in which you and I live, that there is a remnant that believe, a remnant from the nation of Israel. Now, point number two is national Israel, verses seven down through 12. Paul says, he says, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it and the rest were blinded. And, and now he begins to go in and he, he, he takes verses eight and verses nine and he's got a mixture in here, okay? We, we have some Isaiah that he's pulling from. We have some Deuteronomy that he's quoting from. We have from some Psalm 69 from what David said. We have all of these things that are intertwined here together. And he says, just as it is, just as it is written, God has given them a, a spirit, a stupor eyes that they should not see and ears that they, sh they should not hear to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. Let's stop right there. Wow, those are some heavy words. That is some crazy stuff for sure. But the idea of national Israel, the idea is nothing more than this, is that God is not done. He's not done working with national Israel. Again, there's still an amazing plan there. But I want us to understand this because as he gets here to this point, as he's speaking about the nation of a whole, hang on to your seats, okay, right here. As he's speaking about the nation as a whole, he is not speaking about every individual person within that nation. He's not speaking about every single Jew. There are Jews, again, reiteration, there is a remnant that has, that is, and that will be saved. There is a remnant there. According to God's divine election and choice and, and, and all of that stuff that is so far over my head, I don't even know that I'm getting all the right words on the table, but I can just tell you that there are those that he has chosen and there are those that are clearly rejecting and God's plan Again, as it pertains to the nation of, uh, uh, as a whole, he is not speaking about every individual part. How so? Well, verse number seven. Look here in verse number seven. One more time. Uh, he says, what then? Question. He says, has not, uh, he says, Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. Okay, so national Israel and then the, the remnant, the elect. And, and, and notice what he says as to what happens. At the end of verse number seven, he says the rest were blinded. The elect, the remnant, yeah. But the rest of the nation of Israel, they were blinded. I love this word. And you guys are gonna become Greek scholars at this point, okay? You can do it. I'm gonna pronounce it and, and, and then I'm gonna have you say it with me, okay? In the Greek, here's what it says. Pu-ra-o. Pu-ra-o. Now, look to your neighbor and say pu-ra-o. Okay, now don't get offended. They're not saying that you stink, okay? Ha, <laughs> burao. <laughs> I don't know, it just goes well. <laughs> That's not what they're saying. They're, they're, they're saying this, this Greek word means blinded. And, and, and here's what the blindness is. It's losing the power to understand. Jesus desired to do many great works, but what was it that shielded that hardened, that blinded, that turned people away, it was unbelief. It's losing the ability to understand. That's all for today. Join us for our next broadcast of No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer, weekdays at 10.30 a.m. No Greater Love is an outreach ministry of Westminster Calvary and is supported by listeners like you. If you would like to partner with us, please text any dollar amount to 84321. We would like to personally invite you to join us for our weekly worship services Sundays at 8 or 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are located in Westminster, Colorado on the northeast corner of Church Ranch and Wadsworth Parkway near the Vasa Fitness. 
If you're not local, tune into the weekly live stream on our web campus, app, Roku, or on Apple TV. Have you downloaded the free Westminster Calvary app yet? You can stay up to date on coming events, join a small group, request prayer, and watch live worship services. Just search Westminster Calvary on your favorite app store today. Lastly, we're a church that's ready to serve you. If we can do so, give us a call at 303-223-4640. And remember, there's no greater love than when Jesus gave up his life for you and me. Thanks and God bless.